32 minutes past 7 o'clock on 99 FM. It's time for us to go on our daily grind with the Royal Hustle. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier on, this week is a special edition of Royal Hustlers as we are putting powerful women where they belong to be high up there, all right? It's a celebration of the work that they have done, the work that they continue to do, and how it is that they have evolved and changed many lives on that journey. This morning, I'm joined by Christine Yuhu. Many of them, or people know, that um, she She's been a driving force of 99FM for over the last 10 to 15 years. Christine is first and foremost a storyteller. She is a passionate uh, a woman about stories, uh, Namibian stories, stories of the world. And she's passionate behind of the words behind the stories, the languages, the ideas, brands, strategies, the audience. Yes, you and I, the consumer tribe, market cultures, businesses and industries. She is an award-winning author and copywriter, a scriptwriter, brand strategist, creative director and content content editor. She holds a BA from the University of Stellenbosch and a postgraduate diploma in copywriting from Triple A School of Advertising. Her career spans almost two decades of work, ranging from freelance writing, copywriting, journalism, project management, and content creation. I believe somewhere in there she'll always tell she also tell us about how she used to pluck chickens in the United Kingdom as a side hustle. But in 2018, Christine founded Once Upon a Mind, a small movement of ideas, programs, workshops, talks, and events dedicated to empower people with an understanding of their own significance and the potential of their brains and minds. And I must tell you that she has done just that for me. Christine, I'm so glad to have you here. What a, an honor to be here, Shay. Thank uh, you. I think, I think I'm going to be the one tearing up this morning, but I'm going to call <laughs> the tears back. Let's begin with your story. Christine, tell us about your childhood. Uh, did you, what kind of childhood did you have and what kind of things did you get up to as a kid? Um, I had a very happy childhood. Uh, I had a wonderful mother who was innovative and interesting and colorful and uh, larger than life in her mind. Uh, (laughs) At the time, uh, it was it was somewhat disturbing for 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 me, you know, she did not dress like the other mothers. (laughs) And she did not speak like the other mothers. And she didn't do things like the other mothers. Mm -hmm. And now when I got older, I realized what a gift that is to have a mother like that. I had a wonderful father. He's a doctor. He worked extremely hard, um, both him and my mother. And I think work ethic and all of that, you only really can learn by seeing someone doing it. Mm -hmm. So I had a happy childhood. Uh, I was a warrior. So I would worry a lot. I would worry about my parents. I would worry about my sisters and about myself. Mm. Um, so I was a bit anxious. I'm, I was a sensitive child. Mm. But I could also enjoy things tremendously, which is the flip side of being sensitive, is that you also really experience yeah. uh, the magic of it. Absolutely. Tell us about the kind of dreams. What did you dream of? <clears throat> the biggest dream when you are growing up? <clears throat> My biggest dream was, I'm not talking about when I was very little, when everybody wants to be a teacher, Mm -hmm. uh, just because they dressed so nicely and I loved those baskets that they had always with their books. I could see myself having one of those baskets. But no, when I was a bit older, I really thought that I would open an orphanage one day. I wanted wanted to open an orphanage and... Save all the children. Because you're also worried about the children. I know, I'm worried about the children. I still worry about the children. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us about school, Christine. Were you a straight A student? What school did you go to? Did you always pull up the A's or did you have to work at it? Uh, I did very well in primary school. I went to school in, in, in Cape Town at first when uh, my dad was specializing. So I went to Tush's large school um, and I loved that, and then I went when we came back to Ventuk because we all, well, my mom and dad, both came from here. I went to Orman Primary School, mm-hmm. and that was freedom. That was so much fun, and I loved Ventuk. I always loved Namibia, yeah. and we all, we used to come back for holidays uh, all the time that we stayed in Cape Town. But then I went to Orman Primary School, and I, I still did f- f- well, fairly easily. Um, and then I went to high school, Ventuk High School. Uh, and in the beginning I did, but then, you know, it's, life started to get interesting and I met a lot of friends and it became mm-hmm. a, a lot of fun. So I was not a straight A student. I was an B student mm-hmm. um, and I had a real 
wonderful life and time and was involved in all the uh, cultural and artistic mm. uh, elements that, that happened at school. Is that what drove you then to be creative more, to go and choose a career like copywriting or journalism? Is that what then drove yeah, you? Yeah, I, I always yeah. loved language. Yeah. My, my language classes, my, my Afrikaans, mm. I, I actually remember my English and my Afrikaans teachers um, and the, the classes and the content as my favorite part of school. Mm. And I remember we had amazing teachers and uh, the poetry and the language and I always had this absolute um, love for words mm. and stories. So it was, uh, it was a natural development from there on mm. to go into, into, well I first studied BA. Uh, I actually wanted to go study um, drama I can being, see you being, yeah. being quite yeah. a, a drama queen myself, you know, it kind of made sense to me. But yeah. then the drama students had to live in the drama department and they, they could only almost, you know, they had a little subculture of their own. And I, I actually had big, bigger plans for Varsity. I wanted to meet a lot more people, Yeah, yeah. you know, so I changed to a BA and it was wonderful. It was also all about language. I did languages. Yes. I did classical culture. And it shaped a lot of my thinking. Yeah. I remember you telling us a story once about how it doesn't matter how much your parents had achieved for themselves in their lives. You had to start your own journey. And I believe you ended up telling us you plucked chickens in a factory somewhere in the UK. Tell us about that side hustle and any other side hustle that mm. you were a part of or that you took on for life. Yeah, my first side hustle when we were still living in Cape Town, I was, I was probably about eight years old, um, I set up a little stall on the side of the road just around the corner from our house to sell my doll's clothes. But my mom drove past and she very quickly put an end to that little side hustle. I, I, I think I might, I might even have sold one little dress, but I mean, though she was not having it, it, was, it wasn't up for sale and it was, so uh, I did a lot of, of, of writing. Um, in, in later high school and then also at varsity I, I would uh, work for the newspapers in, in the holidays and then I went on a on a um, back then everybody did a working holiday mm, mm, in the UK a mm. lot of people did uh, a gap year I had already mm. finished university by then but then I went over there and I did a lot of I did not actually pluck the chickens but I was a security guard look at you I, I was a security guard with um, in the South Towers in Canary Wharf oh. and I wore a, a uniform and I had a radio that I left everywhere and then I, I'd get into trouble um, and I would do night shifts down in the basement with the trucks coming in to, to, to deliver goods to the Slug and Lettuce, yeah. lettuce Bar, the, yeah. the pub and uh, worked with Moroccans and Indians and um, and it was interesting. It was a character building experience. Yes. I also did caring where I looked after a very old lady mm. and lived with her and cared for her mm. which is also humbling work mm. to do. Mm. And then I did weird things. Mm -hmm. I did data entry for a company that sold gas heaters. So I sat and did that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I um, supervised exams that, that was written and then had to collect and sort out the... So I, I did whatever you had to do. You know, there you just, you, you need to pay the bills. You've got to. You, you know, yeah. and you buy your, your pass, your, your, your tube pass and you get on with it and you yes. pay your rent and you... Get on with it, and it's it's a very very good training ground for life. As long as you're present and you're part of the process, oh, and I being mean, a writer, you know, yes. it, it, no experience is is um, is not valuable yes. because at some point the experience. I mean, uh, now I look with different eyes at, yeah. at, at, at security guards. Yeah. I do. They're yeah. not pot plants. Yeah. I know what it feels like, like to be a, a pot plant. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you are. People don't see yeah. you. So yeah. I make yeah. a point of greeting security guards. Let's talk success. How has your idea of success changed over the course of your life? Uh, it's changed a lot, Shay. I think when I was very young, um, obviously, if you start off in advertising and, and winning the prizes, then obviously you think success is mm. winning the lorry and winning the... Mm big prizes and then getting the best jobs in the coolest places, making money, driving sexy cars. Mm -hmm. you know, I did have 
that notion. Um, I would not say that I was ever really materialistic, but I, I thought it was kind of the obvious package that you would start to buy yourself a very nice car and then you would, you know. But as I got older, I realized that success has everything to do with your relationships mm. with people. And you can have all the rest, but it is the relationships that you manage and sustain and cherish with your co-workers and especially with your with your family and if you can manage that i think that you are really successful that's on the one hand is mm. is your relationships especially with your family mm. your children and your your partner and mm. and then on the other hand i've also realized that if you can find what was put in you that you do really well and and people Often, if you think back at the, at the last time when you fe felt really alive, mm. if you say, the last time I felt really alive, usually when I, I love asking people that because they can usually remember. And it's a surprise to them if you say, where you last felt mostly alive is the seed of, of what it is that you are supposed to do with yourself and with your time. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And it's not even as complicated or as... Elite, you know, as 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 airy fairy as as a calling or a or a it, it it is that too. But it is if you can get into your flow, as mm -hmm. they call it, and do what you are good at. It doesn't matter where you do it, or how many people see, you will be successful in your soul. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I have had you part of that. I feel you talking directly to me. Yeah, because you've given me that space to truly find what I'm good at and deal it like. Every day, six to nine, Monday to Friday, on nine to nine. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your proudest moments, most fulfilling moments at nine to nine FM Tribe Fire Studios. What are some of the things that just come to mind to you? There were many. Shay, you and I know mm. we went through a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Um, as as organic as as life is, and I thought about this, and you know, there was one day that that stands out and it was it was an afternoon where we had um a little bit of a staff get together and we were all in the courtyard in the previous building and we were all at the same time we were dancing to uh mumford and son and baba mm. miles they will be time mm. and there was an energy between the people and we were representative there of probably every mm. um, tribe and, and, in and culture mm. in Namibia. Mm. I think we lacked a German though. Yeah, Maybe did. that was the only one that yeah. was missing. But for, for everything else, yeah, we, covered we had someone. Yeah. And at that point, I felt that we were all completely connected and on the same page. Mm. And I remember it was a strange and, and almost spiritual moment for me dancing on that music in that space and time mm. um, feeling that we are doing the right thing at the right place at the right time with the right people yeah um, I remember that day I remember that day like nobody yeah mm. as a media leader um, what is your hope for the future of the industry in Namibia and internationally what do you think we can do as Namibia in this field where we are on this continent and even beyond internationally I won't even go there because I think um, <clears throat> I don't know who's going to help them. Uh, <laughs> but I think locally, I hope that... I think we sit, we're sitting with an opportunity in Namibia where we still have a hell of a lot of people who need to be uplifted in, in their minds, in their, in their souls and in their spirits and in their brains and and there is no way that you can in a short time get the information and the and the tools and the knowledge to those people fast enough that they can within a day a year really change their mindset and become the masters of their own destiny, mm -hmm. which is the 99th. I mean, the whole, what we've done here, it was <coughs> always from the very beginning, it was to inspire Namibians to be the masters of their own destiny because I really believe that. Mm -hmm. If you understand your own significance mm -hmm. 
and you forget everything you've been told about what you can't do and what you're not and what you didn't get and what you don't have. If you look at this amazing brain that you were given and someone just helps you to unlock the potential, then you can have a better life. You don't have to have, Mm. again, we said, it doesn't mean you need to be the richest and have the biggest mansion and have the biggest TV and drive the fancy car, but to to be content, to be able to provide, to have food on your table, Mm. to have something to get up for in the morning and someone to go to bed with in the evenings Mm. and share your bread with. And I think media can do that. I think that we can, we can because we've got a, a, a digital um, lag, data and airtime is expensive. People don't have the same access to the internet because obviously the internet is a wonderful source of, of mm. learning. But even for people who do, they don't know how to access, access it. They don't know how to go and look for it. Mm. And I think we can, through traditional media, um, print, radio, television. Everybody's got a radio. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got a cell phone that they can stream radio stations uh, without it costing them a lot mm-hmm. of money. Yes. Having television. And I think if we can use media like we have with 99FM to empower people with knowledge and content and telling stories that creates empathy. Because if we can, if we can understand where someone else comes from, it takes away the prejudice, it takes away yeah. the racism, it takes away the hatred um, and the feelings of, of, of entitlement and even of, of being betrayed by fate. Yeah. If we can hear someone else's story, then you can connect with him. And we have the storytelling platforms. Absolutely. That happens automatically. Yeah. We come into the last question. I know that we can have this conversation for se- for an hour. I know we can go on, but we don't have that time. We got bills waiting to pay. <laughs> but right now, what are the three things that you are loving about the land of the brave? Right now, what are the three things that are coming to your heart? Compliments of Namibia. I love you, Shay. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Make it to Christine's top three. Yes. <laughs> I love you too. I love I love the energy and the spirit of the young people mm. like you and I see them and, and, and it it excites me because from the very beginning when we started 99 and we said there is a tribe of people out there mm. the new generation and they are going to make this work and and I see people and especially you know a lot of single mothers a lot of people hustling but they've got the spirit and they've got the drive and that makes me extremely excited and I think it's it's maybe not exclusive to Namibia but the Namibians yes. that I see and also through our um, Master Your Destiny yes. uh, uh, you know the, the latest journal yes. that, that we did and, and editing all those stories these stories yeah. are, imp- are, 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 are it's for me it's one of the best things about Namibia so that's the one thing the second thing is spring yeah. and the colors yeah. and the and I always love it it always it's it's always it doesn't matter you know the colors of namibia and the 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 textures um i think is is unique to the world but this year after this year that we've had it felt like nature was throwing us a bone and saying you know it it will carry on and there's new life and the old earth will follow its rhythm regardless of all our drama yeah. and yeah. Uh, frantic running around yeah. it will stay true to its yeah. ancient rhythms and that's why if you go back to nature you will find that yes. rhythm and then something that I think also that I've been aware of is the sense of humor of people especially the youth and I see them you know they're making their point I see it on Twitter a lot with <laughs> with standing up to people in power who are saying things yeah. that they don't agree with. Um, and you always have your, your people who really come with their negativity and, and what have you. But a lot of people really are taking the mickey out of it. And they, you know, they're calling them out, but yeah. they do it in a, in a very funny and fun way. They're saying, we're not having this anymore. We're yeah. not having fish rot. Yeah. We're not having corruption. Yeah. We are not having lies. And then they just put a little twist on it. To, to say, you know what? Don't we're not going to take it so serious. We're gonna we're yeah. gonna make it right, yeah. but we're gonna hold you to it. Accountable. To and it. I think yeah. that's a. I think we've come a long way yeah. to get to this point. Christine, we are very excited to see your next journey unfold. To see what you put your hands on turn to gold. I'm saying this because 
I've seen that happen. We look forward to the stories you will continue telling. I'm sure that is something that's in your heart and you're going to take it wherever you go. And we can't wait to see how you've just explained Namibia unfold with the youth being part of it, with a little sense of humor and some color for spring. Thank you so much for joining me this morning and thank you so much for being a part of my journey for the past eight years. You've done so much for me inside and even molding and shaping even this show here. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you, Shay. It's wonderful. Yeah. I, this is one of my most like this is like the interview that I'm actually supposed to be crying like you've never heard me cry on air but I'm going to behave okay because my boss is on the building <laughs> but what an amazing story she is a storyteller so what do you expect what you need to do now is to backtrack to our website you need to get a hold of all three MYD journals you need to head on over to social media start following us and you need to understand that it's time now to do the work because so many people have done the work for you already it's time to jump on board and get a part of it all. There you have it for your Royal Hustle this morning. Head on over to social media in case you miss it.